Land art. What is land art? Well, I'm here today to define that for you, and more importantly, to explain to you what relevance land art has to your life. This is not land art. <laughs> this is a very famous painting, the Mona Lisa. It's a beautiful painting. It's quite old. It's, it's oils on a canvas. It's framed in a beautiful frame, and it's hanging on the wall at the Louvre. And millions of people see it every year, and they see it in the same way. This is land art. Robert Smithson, back in 1970, con installed what's considered to be the first land art installation in the country. And it was a, is a response to social issues that had been happening through the 60s. It's sort of back to the land. And this is the Great Salt Lake, a beautiful, swirling, 1,500-foot-long form out there in the water. It's made, of, uh, it's made of stone, it's made of sand, it's made of red algae. And you can go out there and you can see it and smell it and look at it from all different points of view and be a part of the environment. Its frame is nature. So now you know a little bit about what land art maybe is. And, and I wanted to share with you four key characteristics that might help you to identify it when you see it, when you're, you're out in, in the world. The first is genius loci. The, this is a very old term. It's Roman in origin, and it means spirit of place. The first image here representing what I think is an excellent example of spirit of place is the lightning field by Walter D. Maria. It's out on the expanse of the western New Mexico desert. It's a collection of tall stainless steel poles, 400 of them, that are placed in a very precise grid out in the landscape. And it's, it's something that people can go out and walk through and experience and experience that landscape at the same time. And it's even been known to attract lightning from time to time. Another wonderful example is actually in Nepal. It's a labyrinth, as you can probably see, which is derivative of the, the culture there. The, the religious beliefs for, for millennia of the people have a labyrinth as a part of, of that worship. And this particular piece is, again, an experiential land form that comes up out of the earth, and one can go out and participate in it, walk through it, and experience it. And it's very meaningful to that culture, to that place. A smaller uh, an, uh, installation that's smaller in scale, closer to home, is in New York City. And this is actually something that was constructed in the last year. It is a response to Hurricane Sandy from last year and the devastation that occurred in that area. Uh, it's in the form of a heart. This is actually placed out on a sidewalk in, in Manhattan and where people just walk by it. Uh, the, it is constructed from the wood of the boardwalks that were damaged so, so heavily in that storm. And it is, a, in essence, a memorial. People walk by, they, they walk on top, they have their photograph taken, they experience it, and it says something very important about that community. The second characteristic is temporal, or relating to time. Andy Goldsworthy's work is very ephemeral in nature. He typically will go out onto a site, get to know that site very well, and then have a response to the elements of that site. This is a beautiful ice sculpture. He went out one morning, he, he picked ice, uh, icicles from various locations, put them together, created this beautiful spiraling shape around a tree, and by the end of the day, it was gone. An installation in New York City about 15 years ago by Christo, who's quite a famous artist, you may be familiar with, he wrapped buildings and wrapped islands, and uh, this was something that he installed in Central Park and shows very specifically the time of year, February, which was very dreary. There's no color, there's no leaves on the trees. And his, his concept was to line the walkways of Central Park 
23 miles long with these gates. And on each gate hung fabric, saffron fabric. And as people would walk through this, it was like a sea of saffron flowing in the breeze. Millions and millions were drawn to New York City to experience this. And it was only up for 16 days. Now on the other end of the spectrum, Stonehenge is about 4,000 years old, as best we know. And it, we think, is, was uh, based in, in religious beliefs and had something to do with the sunrise and the sunset or whatever. But it is, it is a, a piece that just is, is, is the essence of the Southern Plains of, of London, and, and people come and see it um, in, in droves. And I would call this pretty permanent art. The third characteristic is participatory. A downed tree in France, actually a white pine, was, was repurposed into a piece of art that's participatory. People can, can, as you can see in the photograph, can sort of crawl in there under the, the roots of the tree and see how it was all formed and how that tree used to, to be uh, down in, in the earth. And you can get up into the canopy and discover sort of what that tree canopy is all about. So in addition to being interesting, it's also very educational. This is a wonderful little gateway designed by a, a German artist. And it's right on the seam between the city and the forest. And she has this wonderful char characteristic of being able to make parts of her piece look as if they're floating ethereal through the air. And it's, it's a portal, in essence. And it, it almost makes you feel like, Gosh, I can walk through this and I'm in the enchanted forest. But it is a very participatory piece. It's a, it's a passage. A California artist, Judith Selby Lang, and her husband have spent many years combing the beaches of California and picking up plastic. And they have utilized this plastic in many forms and fashions for, for artworks. One that she was engaged in in Palo Alto actually engaged the community. And she brought all of this plastic garbage to the city, gathered around all this community who, who were interested in participating. They cut out all of these strips of plastic, formed these spheres, and they were all placed out on the, the, the bowling lawn in Palo Alto, which on one hand is kind of fun, but on the other hand, yeah, it starts to really make you th think about the plastic and the environment and the impact. And the fourth characteristic is that land art is very public. This wonderful little piece uh, is in Madrid. And it's one of a series, uh, a whole series done by a group that felt like they were so distressed that their city didn't have any trees or any greenery and was pretty, was, was pretty hard. And so they went through the city finding all the little leftover spaces and places that they could and planted, planted trees, and then put these wonderful little covers over them. So now there's this sort of man-made forest through the city of Madrid that will hopefully grow. In, in Dover, back to, to England again, very simple piece, a line of stones that runs along the top of the cliffs, the chalk cliffs there. And it marks the, the, the change in the landscape and the erosion on, uh, of the cliffs. This is just out, out in nature. It doesn't cost you $30 to go buy a ticket. You can come out and see a piece like this at any time. And one of my favorites, again, back to New York City, the High Line, a repurposed rail line that uh, is about a mile in length. And it's, it's a public park now, a linear park. And people are just so in, infatuated with this place. They come out and they walk it, and they sit, and they watch other people, or they look at the birds or the flowers or whatever is going on out there. And it's, it's truly changed the face of lower, the lower side of, of Manhattan, the lower west side. So. This is, this is all great and wonderful, but you might be saying to yourself, well, OK, but what relevance does this really have to me? Again, back to that term, 
genius loci, spirit of place. We, we have, over the course of five decades or so, mostly since post-World War II, allowed our cities to evolve into places that have no sense of place. Uh, could be anywhere in the world, for, for what you can tell about this, that have sort of lost, lost that original reason for being, that sort of sense of what makes it special, what makes it unique. Uh, when, when Robert Smithson began his work in 1970 with the Spiral Jetty, as I mentioned, it was a response to the social values of the 60s, the, the, the decade that they felt was very artificial and plastic and consumer consumption. And, and this was the back to earth movement. And the, um, the land art, in fact, is, is what can help bring that sort of a awareness and sense of place back to a community that has become so, so homogenous. I'd like to, to, to reinforce this experience with uh, something that I've been involved in in the last uh, two years, a, a part environmental art project. The, the thing about environmental art that, that is really wonderful is not only does it create or reinforce that sense of place, but it does so through a community, through a community process. None of these kinds of projects happen with one person. It, there's a community behind all of them. About two years ago, a couple of friends and I a, a de a developed a project that we named Art on Site, Tribute Trail in Nevada City, and it's along Deer Creek. And it, the, the project began with, with a trail, an existing trail, and an idea about how Nevada City's got a pretty wonderful sort of genius loci, but, but being able to sort of build on that and put that next layer of interest. And we said, let's do a pub public land art installation. One of the first things that continued through the entire process of that project was pulling community together to make it happen. And I would say there's probably over 100 people engaged in that project by the time uh, it was actually opened in September of this year. And um, it's, it's one of those wonderful things where you've got people working together who might not have ever known each other, who had never, would have never crossed paths with each other before, but they've come together for this common goal for the community, and it's, it's, it's been a really wonderful experience. So in conclusion, I, I think this quote says my feelings pretty well, except that I'd modify it uh, just a little bit to say that land art can open up the souls of the city's inhabitants. So find the genius loci in your place and celebrate it. Thank you.